welcome to this live Q&A. Um, most of you would have already seen our recording on a, an excellent discussion, very insightful discussion on the new public health order for Africa, fin specifically on financing and investment opportunities in healthcare systems and infrastructure. So I'm ex really excited uh, to have another opportunity to delve some more into some of the investment opportunities, some of the recommendations, and um, we'll be sure to answer your questions um, during, during this, uh, this live Q&A. So first, please feel free to put any questions you have in either the chat room or the Q&A room. It is really a pleasure to have you here with us today. We'll try to get through to as many questions as we possibly can in our time together. So, but before I do that, I just want to quickly um, introduce our speakers for today, starting with myself. My name is Lolem Gong, and I will serve as your panel chair. I'm the chief of staff at AMREF Health Africa, and really glad to be here. And our speakers for today, for at least this first uh, portion, while we wait for others to join, are Dr. Anastasia Nyalita, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Kenya Healthcare Federation, KHF, and also Dr. Rispa Walumbe, who's the Health Policy Advisor at AMREF Health Africa. And joining us shortly will be Mrs. Azuka Okeke, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Africa Resource Center for Excellence in Supply Chain, in Supply Chain Management, excuse me, and also Dr. Jane Karonga, who is an Economic Affairs Officer at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So the other, our other two speakers will join us a little bit later, but in the meantime, again, please do feel free to put your questions in the chat. So we'll start with one of the questions we received ahead of our, of, of this session. And I'll ask that question to, um, to Dr. Um, Rispa. And um, so Rispa, you know, in our, in our, we've of course discussed just some of the challenges, um, some of the opportunities for investing in health. And um, we've discussed, we've, we, we discussed in our last session, opportunities for resource mobilization, also investing in different aspects of healthcare. So one of the questions we have um, for you is, what are your recommendations as to turning Africa's health challenges into investment opportunities? Over to you, Rispa. So thanks again, uh, Lolem, for the uh, introduction and also just, you know, kind of taking us through how, you know, um, I think we had a really interesting conversation and I think we already mentioned some of the, you know, the pain points that we have, but also the opportunities. And I think one of the things that we have to also realize is that generally given the architecture of Africa's health systems, as much as we have very many difficulties, very many challenges, there's so many opportunities that are bound and I think we shouldn't let them, um, you know, fall short. So I think if I was to kind of summarize what I would say as the key opportunities that we need to focus on, it's really just to, um, you know, understand the, the kind of like the architecture we have as a region when it comes to ensuring, you know, better, faster trade, um, you know, kind of, I think we, we really went in depth about the, um, you know, discussing the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's some leverage points we have there, right? So it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't specify like, you know, investing in that, but investing in the opportunities it shows or it, 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 um, it allows, because I think that gives us a really good opportunity for us to really just um, capitalize on what we have as a continent and um, really look beyond our challenges. Um, the other thing I would also, um, you know, look at as a really big opportunity is, you know, there was a lot of efforts that were made by government, by private sector, when it came to um, a response towards COVID. Um, we mounted very strong responses. We established a lot of systems. We established, um, you know, technologies that were able to ensure we're uh, still providing care even from remote um, places. Um, we established points of, um, you know, call centers, for instance, in different countries. Um, so these are kind of the things that I would say we need to carry forward. These are the places where, because it's proven to work in a crisis situation, 
surely in a in a in a working you know system it should it, it should flourish right mm -hmm. um so i wouldn't i wouldn't forget those i think those are really important for us to uh, to focus on so all those health system strengthening efforts um those networks we provided um for the flow of goods from point x to point y uh, we really need to leverage on those and then um i think uh, most importantly this one i'll underline is the investments that we can make on our healthcare professional because we have the best i will i will talk you know uh, i'll talk <laughs> you know just I'll, I'll i'll blow blow my own trumpet and say that i think we have the best healthcare professionals right and that's why people are coming from all over the world to you know get them um, so I think those were <laughs> those were one of the things that those are the three things I would say we need to invest in. We need to invest in our healthcare professionals, um, ensuring that they have, you know, the, um, better access to be able to deliver better. Um, and, and, and also looking at the health system strengthening efforts we made during COVID-19. And of course, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which I think was very well outlined by Jane last time. Thanks. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. I really enjoyed that conversation and really just the um, abbreviated history of how the Africa Free Trade um, Continental Agreement came about and the opportunities that exist. I agree with you. I think that was really, uh, um, it was uh, like Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement 101. It was really a, a fantastic class. But one of the, so one of the things you mentioned and um, is really around um, capitalizing on on what we have, and instead of you know establishing or looking at whole new systems, looking at what came out of the pandemic. Yes, we're still in the pandemic, but looking at those systems, those efforts that have come about as a result of the pandemic, and really building on them instead of establishing new ones. And so this leads me then to my question to you, um, Dr. Anastasia, which is that. And this is one of the questions that was sent to us, um, is that what can be done? So as, as, as RISPA says, you know, there are opportunities that we can capital, capitalize on. There are systems that have um, uh, been created, established. Um, so what can be done to further leverage, particularly the private sector, to improve access to healthcare? Um, we talk about access to healthcare in a, a, a normal time, if you will, and then access to healthcare during crisis. So how do you think, or what can be done to further leverage private sector in a time of crisis to improve access to healthcare? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Lulim, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and good evening. Um, so indeed, like I mentioned in my, um, earlier presentation, um, you know, the private sector in Kenya is very well organized. So one of the things that uh, from a continental perspective is we need to strengthen the way private sector is coordinated and organized, you know. So we have a one voice for the private health sector or even for the entire private sector because the interventions that we're going to look at and the opportunities that we have is not only going to be led by the, it's not a health sector, issue, but there will be prosperity issues. So, and, and therefore, the need to ensure that the private sector is organized within the health space and also within the, you know, the general space. So that's one. And for, for, for example, in Kenya, we have that very well organized. The second bit is on now on the policy on the public sector side, that, um, from a regulatory, from a policy perspective, is also to have policies that actually enable uh, the collaboration and coordination between the public and the private sector, you know, using the structures that will have been established on the on the private sector side. Of course, the public sector is very well organized. Important to have enabling policies, but also more important to have a framework, a coordination or partnership framework that really, you know, uh, outlines or speaks to how the two will speak together. So th that for me is, is, is very important. But more important also is to also ensure that both sides understand what are those opportunities and how what are the modalities for engaging yeah and then you know the the culture of co-creating this solution so that we can actually better optimize and leverage you know the private sector with all its efficiencies and uh, you know all the good stuff that comes in the private sector 
uh, to better collaborate also with the public sector to, to really, you know, one health at the end of the day is, is what we're aiming to. So for me, it's a policy framework and also, you know, better organize the private sector beyond just health. Thank you. Yeah, and so Dr. Anastasia, please um, stay unmuted because I do want to probe further on, um, you know, these two points that you've made. And so, you know, sometimes we, we say these things and they sound really good. Um, I was wondering if you have some examples, whether Kenya, whether another country, um, just some examples of how, um, that of, of the types of policies um, that need to be in place to provide this enabling environment, right? Or yeah. an example of, um, you know, what exactly does a coordination framework look like? And in that coordination framework, what, what, what is the role of public sector? What is the role of private sector? Like what is, what should be key um, in that framework to ensure that there's proper collaboration between private and public sector? So maybe yeah. just one, one or two examples that you've seen so our audience also gets a practical sense of what this means. Yeah, yeah thank you, Lorem. Uh, for example, in Kenya, we have a, we have a partnership coordination per framework for health. Uh, and in that, it stipulates who should sit in. And for example, as Kenya Healthcare Federation, we have a seat on the different levels of interagency coordinating uh, uh, committees but also the steering committee and uh, the oversight committee. So, you know, within that, and currently as we speak, actually the team is in, uh, in a workshop in Ibasha, really now crystallizing what is it that needs to really be the content, the fine tune, the, the actual, you know, aspects that uh, needs to be defined. So from, from a Kenya perspective, that's very, we have a framework, you know, KHF has been invited to the table to present private sector. Of course, there are other sector players within that. And we are co-creating, you know, the, the actual operationalization of the coordination process. So for me, that, that's, that's a live example. And this is what yes. now, uh, you know, within the other countries in the continent that needs to be in place. From the private sector perspective, I think, um, you know, private sector will continue to do its piece. But you know, that needs to speak to the same objectives of health, which is at the end of the day is one health. So the coordination is very, very, very important. Thank you. Yes, yes. No, thank you, thank you. I think it's always great for, for um, people to know that these are not things that are foreign. When we say these things, they're not foreign. They actually do exist. And we have um, sort of exemplar countries that are doing it, right? Um, so, so yes, thank, thank you for that. And I hope I didn't put you on the spot by my further probing. No, it's fine. So, I mean, it's stuff that we do and we, yeah. we engage and collaborate a lot. We have a very open uh, dialogue with the, with, the, with, with the Ministry of Health and, the, and, and also at all levels of governance as well, as I mentioned earlier. And through CAPSA, you know, the other ministries and the presidential and the government, uh, what do you, the cabinet, actually today, mm -hmm was supposed to be in a meeting with the cabinet speaking matters half, you know, as private sector. So government, private sector round tables. But unfortunately, I think they said they're in Tanzania, so that has been postponed. But just to tell you that indeed that collaboration is very live for us at mm -hmm. Kepsa and for us at, 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 at Kepsa. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe later on, I'll just uh, uh, already pose a question for you to think about. Um, while I go to, uh, to, to Azuka next. And it's, um, you know, in those, as you're developing this framework or implementing this, later on, maybe you can just speak to what is your scorecard? Because I think it's also important that as we talk about these extremely fantastic goals to collaborate with private sector and really bring private sector into public, public sector and have public sector learn from private sector, we need to also understand like what, what does measurement mean? How are we measuring success? So with, with um, so, so moving on, Azuka, welcome. Um, thank you very thank, much. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see you. And um, I was just going through some of the questions we got ahead of time. And I'll, I'll, ask, um, I'll ask you the same 
question that I asked Rispa. And um, so the question to that I asked Rispa at the beginning, I, and I, I uh, sort of uh, some context to that was around us. We talked about some of our challenges. We talked quite a lot, I think, about um, just opportunities as well. So one of the questions that we got is, what are your recommendations to turning Africa's health challenges into investment opportunities? So I'm wondering in your field, and you, you spoke so well about how, about brokering public-private partnerships in, 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 in Nigeria. Um, you also, I think, uh, gave us uh, just a flavor of some of the things that, you know, the Africa Free Trade Agreement needs to really look to or some of the things that we should be thinking about as we um, hold um, them accountable. So wondering if you can also just share with us um, just some of the investment opportunities that you see. Okay, thank you very much. And do bear with me if my network drags a bit. I'm okay. struggling with technology this morning. Okay, um, and thank you for um, uh, for the question. And I was uh, I was listening to Rispa, and uh, I think uh, not. I think not, yeah, not Rispa, um, but um, Dr. Anastasia. Dr. Anastasia. So thank you very much. And I, I was smiling because you know she she mentioned something, and I'll write on that. She said as public sector continues to learn from private sector we hope to see better collaboration. Now, in our own case, not sure of Kenya or even Tanzania, but in Nigeria, one of the things we've seen over time is that when it comes to um, trade and investment around health, that a lot of work has gone on, and I, I, thankfully through partners, um, our donor agencies, a lot of technical work has been done within the public sector around policy development strategy. So we actually have a very um, richly aware and uh, um, public sector. But when it comes to doing business with, we find that the issues we normally tackle with is that the private sector does not understand the language of health or public health. And it becomes a challenge because they are used to the commercial they are used to profit and doing business that speaks around health impact and health outcomes. Um, the language difference makes doing business difficult. So the opportunities are that um, we must look at the private sector in Africa as a, a, a maturing public health system. It's not matured. And even more so in the field where I work in, which is supply chain. Um, when we started trying to broker business between, because there's a lot of opportunities with the, within, um, you can imagine now within Africa for local manufacturing, for health, you know, we have to look inwards. Now we have um, districts or state governments trying to buy or procure essential medicines, um, you know, what millions of dollars and the, almost now falls on the local manufacturers to do that. Now to do that, you do need to look at kind of like some collaborative partnerships because it will not be, um, some of them is not being done through the typical um, framework contracting models or bidding process because again, some of these states don't have that institution. Some of them have weak procurement systems. So we're looking at leveraging each other's strengths. So we're looking at um, innovative PPPs, public-private partnerships. So in that PPP, it's, we usually say we have to grow together because both the public and the private, let us acknowledge that we have maturing systems and we have to grow together, understand what the needs are together and begin to do business in a seamless way. And the major challenges we normally face is that the private sector is not, doesn't understand what we're talking about. The language of public health is quite new. The language of policy strategies, what they want is I want to sell and you just give me my money. It doesn't work mm -hmm. like that with mm -hmm. So the, the opportunities now is, is that we are we we have created platforms where we educate, 
where we create an awareness, expose the private sector to global trends. They need to understand some of these opportunities and see how it impacts public health. I'm beginning even to change, you know, like kind of like you need to rethink your strategy within the system. Look, think bigger, have bigger visions. You're going to be addressing the outcome of a, a district that may have up to 10 million people. And you don't think of that area as in where I sell to one or two, three shops, if I'm talking about local manufacturers. So for us, the opportunity now is that as we look keen at how to transform business in Africa, there's a, a, a huge need to build the capacity of the private sector. So they understand the public health needs, the public health language. You have a meeting, you are talking SDGs and they don't even know what SDG yes. means. So mm -hmm. you're speaking a different language. So for me, that is a focus for us, that, the, that therein lies an opportunity to really bring private sector up to speed to what public sector is saying and the language of public health. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Azuka. I, and I, um, I agree with you. I think one of the things that we do in public health is that we, I think we feel that everybody just understands and everyone should uh, prioritize public health because I mean, it's public health, who wouldn't want to? But we forget that, you know, we have to speak, as you're saying, with private sector, we also have to speak sort of their marketing language and, and have them understand why this is important, why public health affects their, their business output um, and why it's important for them to invest in, in, in public health or to collaborate. Um, with the with the with the public sector. So thank you for that. Um, so Rispa, I want to come to you because we talk about and, and you and you spoke passionately about the health force. Um, and, and so I'm just, you know, maybe you can spend some time, just a, a little bit of time uh, elaborating on, you know, what it, what what can we do specifically? to shift the needle on one, building the capacity and, and maybe not building the capacity, I'll, I take that back, really on um, better management of our health workforce. And when I say better management, I mean, I mean in terms of distribution, compensation, um, and ensuring that the caliber or the, the cadre of health workers really matches our public health needs. Rispa? Um, I, I feel like I got the very, very hard question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to solve, um, you know, like the, the health workforce issue. <laughs> I think it's, but no, but happy to, happy to attempt an answer. Um, so I think when you're looking at um, what needs to be done, um, I think that when we look at the health workforce, often the statements that you hear, especially when it comes to investments in health workforce, you say, um, you know, people say it's the highest, you know, cost, the cost driver of a healthcare system. It is, you know, it's, it's the most volatile investment because, you um, you know, these are people who you will, who are dedicated to this particular service provision and you will have to pay them, you know, regardless every single month, you have to pay them a salary and you have to make sure all, you know, all these things. But I think people forget that um, without the healthcare workforce, you, there are certain things you cannot um, outsource in that sense. You can't, you cannot find some other thing to do the job that a healthcare worker does, um, at least for now, and I think in the foreseeable future, right? Um, so I think when you're looking at what does what does it mean to shift the needle, like what what is that leverage point? Then the thing is, I would say, is to focus on, um, you know, the planning process, and I think I mentioned this earlier was the planning process around healthcare, health workforce distribution, was looking at what are the key things. How, do you, how could you be in a situation where you're leveraging the fact that, fine, you don't have very many healthcare workers, but how is it possible to spread them around, let's say the community or the, um, or the constituency in a way that makes sense? So it could be that you want to make sure that a healthcare worker is able to move from one, uh, let's say county, in, in Kenya to another um, when they need be when need be. So for instance, I know that sometimes some consultants are able to move, uh, they're able to be um, shared amongst counties. 
because the cost of a consultant generally is very expensive and it's very difficult for you to be able to um, you know, bear that burden alone. But if you're able to say that if this consultant can come twice a week to our county and then in the next two days, he goes to the other county and you can share the costs and you're able to plan, you're able to say that we have a consultant who provides medical, um, for instance, uh, you could say like if it's a physician, you have a physician who's coming down to the village twice um, a week in your county and that looks good for everyone. It looks good politically, it looks good for the hospital, it increases the traffic and it also increases confidence in the facility, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to build now a fully fledged um, a district hospital in that place, right? You could, you could plan for it and schedule it. In the meantime, you could say, what we want to do is want to make sure that at least people have access to, um, you know, a senior, a senior physician um, at least twice a week. And we can share that between two counties. Um, so I'm not saying things that I'm manufacturing at the back of my head. These are things that are already being done in terms of trying to, you know, uh, but I think it's about taking these things to scale um, and looking at them um, more holistically. Because often what I find is we're very used to speaking in our own um, spaces, in our own silos, whether it's public sector, private sector, or even within public sector, one county not talking to another. Um, and I think these are the kind of ways you can just bridge the gap. Um, and it's not just for um, you know, consultants, it's not just for medical doctors, it could be for pharmacists, it could be for nurses, it could be for so many people. Um, just the way you design it. You could say, this is the need, this is what our patients need, or this is what our community needs, and then figuring out how to bridge that gap, yeah. but then taking it to scale. So not just doing it on a small scale, looking at how you can do it large scale, because it could be something that applies to the entire county. Mm -hmm. um, and then that way also it increases, um, you know, uh, healthcare worker um, uh, confidence to be able to know I can, I'll be able to, first of all, secure some kind of um, employment because you have so many unemployed uh, healthcare workers um, in, a, you know, I'd know at least in the context of Kenya. And, um, and, and that's, the, that's the kind of, um, I think, narrative we need to shift, especially given the fact that we do need them. There's nothing we can do about that. You need them. So you, there's no other choice but to invest in them. But I think those are the first step, the steps in terms of being able to collaborate across um, jurisdictions. I think that's the first, that's the first thing I would say. Um, I don't know if there's, if there's any, if, if no one else listens to anything else I say, I think that's the only suggestion I can give. Um, yeah, because I think there's still so much that we need to do um, to discuss it and unpack it. Um, but, um, but the, oh, the other thing I would also say is also just making sure that you allow them to do their job because a lot of times it's very difficult for people to be able to do their jobs and there's also a lot of external interference. So yeah, yeah. thanks. So you see, it wasn't a difficult question after all because you answered it so well. <laughs> Thank you, Rispa. In, in, in the last uh, two minutes that we have together, I, I wanted to um, just do a, um, a round robin as we conclude. So first to Dr. Anastasia. So one is any thoughts on the scorecard? Uh, what, what, what does success look like? Just briefly, what does success look like? And the, your, your, my, my concluding question is what would be the most challenging thing to implement? So as we talk about this collaboration with public and private sector, what is the most challenging um, aspect of this for you? Very briefly. I think one of the biggest, I will start with the last. So one of the biggest challenges we have is building trust between the two parties. Um, really, um, but in terms of the challenge to implement is the public-private collaborations because uh, in health in particular, because the understanding, you know, we're still at very um, early stages of really understanding what uh, public-private partnerships uh, are when it comes to service, at least in Kenya, that has been uh, redefined to include uh, service delivery or services. So, you know, like Ministry of Health together with private sector and other stakeholders have developed a public-private collaboration strategy for health, which basically describes, um, you know, what does partnerships, uh, PPPs look like in health, for example. Now, the, the, the thing that will take a long time is really bring everybody to the same level of understanding what is a PPP versus what is a, 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 PP, a public private, you know, a sort of procurement agreement, mm -hmm. things like that. So that's, that's, that's gonna, but the minute, uh, when we hack it, 
then that will go a long way. So the understanding, some level understanding of what a PPP is in health and how to take that forward, I think that's an opportunity that we must drive. In terms of a scorecard and looking at what we have for Kenya, for example, it's, it's, it's very well defined. So we have, what is the partnership principle, government ownership, for example, and what is expected of a non-state actor, support and collaborate with the government to achieve the country health agenda, develop and share plans and reports with UK and sector partners, and the alignment, you know, ensure agency projects and plans are aligned to health sector, plans priorities at the national and county levels and provide requested information to GOK to inform planning, budgeting and review processes. And of course, also to inform policy and review the level of alignment of different actors in the common agenda. Harmonization, establish systems to ensure there is to harmonize commitments, actively participate in sector coordination, build capacity of non-state actors to ensure harmonization of investments. We have had um, our colleague from Nigeria talking about you know, how public private sector has been left behind you know, public sector in terms of capacity building and understanding the, lang the language of public health. That's very important. So there, there are many, including managing results, mutual accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, and consultation, and, 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 and empowerment. Things like building the right. capacity of non-state actors to actively engage and participate in sector processes and forums. So in terms of, from a Kenyan perspective, the scope had very well defined, and now we are at that stage of actually now operationalizing it. Thank you, Lola. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Rispa, on the last question. Just one major challenge, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I think that if you look at what the major challenge would be, um, that we could we could really just move forward with is is again breaking down those silos. I think I'll just go back to that because I think that's um, where we have so many opportunities that are bound. I'm sure there's so many situations where you know where uh, Dr. Anastasia sits, um, she sees like there's a solution. There's something that we've seen that has worked, mm -hmm. and then on the other side, you also have the government that is saying, wait, we actually have something that. Uh, we have we we were willing to invest in this thing, but we don't know if there's anyone who could help us solve this problem. So I think I would just say that if we could just break down the silos and have more dialogues like this, because often I feel like at the end of um, you know panel sessions, you're like, okay, then now what next? After we've given all this um, you know great advice, how do we move it forward? And I think if there's anything I can say that you know for the people listening is just break down those silos, reach across the divide, talk to people you've never spoken to before. Um, you know, look at different perspectives and just just engage because I think that's how we get started. And and so with that, I thank both of you. I think unfortunately, um, Azuka had to drop off. Uh, she had mentioned she had some internet challenges. So thank you both for 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 being with us today. And um, a big thanks to the organizers. And with that, I thank you, audience, for staying with us. Thank you for your questions and hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Have a good one. Bye-bye.